Mathematics and music may seem very separate, but I will show you how they are connected. Where should we start? Let's start at the beginning of the alphabet. That's an A440. We'll talk about what that means later. Instruments all look different, but they have something in common. When an instrument plays a note, something vibrates that causes pressure changes that travel through the air and finally get to your ear. Mathematicians have studied vibrating objects extensively and their work helps us understand the sounds produced. When any object vibrates, it causes movement in the air particles. These particles bump into the particles close to them, which make them vibrate too, causing them to bump into more air particles. This movement, called sound waves, keeps going until they run out of energy. If your ear is within range of the vibrations, you'll hear the sound. Picture a stone thrown into a still body of water. The rings of waves expand indefinitely. The same is true with sound. Irregular repeating sound waves create noise, while regular repeating waves produce musical notes. When the vibrations are fast, you hear a high note. When the vibrations are slow, it creates a low note. When we play a 440 note, we might ask what frequencies are produced. We call it 440 hertz. That is named after the German physicist Heinrich Hertz. The higher the frequency, the higher the vibrations per second. For an A440 note, the waves are coming 440 times per second. Now you might think that the string is just going up and down 440 times per second, but it's a little more complicated than that. Look at a 440 on the spectrum. What the spectrum is showing is that the note vibrates at many different frequencies all at the same time. So what is the difference between frequency and pitch? Frequency and pitch describe the same thing, but from different viewpoints. Frequency measures the cycle rate of the waveform. Pitch is how high or low it sounds when you hear it. So basically, like frequency is a physical aspect of sound and can be measured objectively with a, like, with a microphone and an oscilloscope. Pitch is how you perceive the sound. Look at the cone of a stereo speaker. Notice how the speaker pushes out with each beat. This compresses air molecules and begins a wave-like motion. Air reacts in a similar manner to water when a pebble is dropped into it, creating a series of waves that move out. Think of the water as the air and the pebble as the sound. The sound waves move out from the sound source in all directions, getting quieter and quieter as it moves farther and farther away. You can think of the small pebble as representing a high frequency or a high pitch because it creates small waves that are very close together. And then a large rock you can think of that as a low frequency or a low pitch because it requires larger waves that need more space to develop. So what is a wave? You take something that is resting and create a disturbance, causing individual particles to oscillate back and forth. If you create a wave across a string, the speed that the wave moves depends on the tension of the string. A sound wave is a disturbance of the air. The speed of sound waves are determined by the properties of the air. Have you ever seen someone inhale helium and their voice gets real high and squeaky? That's because when you replace regular air with helium, the air gets lighter. Whenever you make something lighter, the wave or disturbance can move it more quickly. If you play a wind instrument, the pitch of the wind instrument goes out of tune if you keep it outside in the cold and then bring it inside to play. Again, that's because the temperature of the air affects the speed of sound. That affects the density of air and how one molecule can run into the next. Sound in room temperature travels at about 340 meters per second. When we look at the picture of a sound wave, 
we can see that the top of the wave represents molecules being forced together and the bottom of the wave represents molecules pushing apart. Sounds are created when molecules are forced together. One complete vibration of a wave is known as a cycle. This is how we relate these pitches to numbers. When you play one note, you're also hearing a whole series of higher tones that are sounding at the same time. If I play a C, that's the fundamental. Within that tone is a higher C and a higher G then up to C. Within that is also an E, a G, B flat, C, D, E, F sharp, G, A flat, B flat, B natural, high C. When you play a string, it vibrates across the whole string, but also fractional segments of that string, each vibrating separately. It's as if the string is divisible into two halves, three thirds, four quarters. The smaller these segments are, the faster they vibrate creating higher and higher frequencies and pitches. These overtones and harmonics are all sounding out together with the fundamental tone. The overtones and harmonies are much quieter than the fundamental. It's easier to hear the harmonic series in low tones. When we hear one note played with another one that's twice its frequency, they sound so harmonious that we assign them the same letter and define the difference between them as an octave. The rest of the scale is squeezed into that octave. It's divided into 12 half steps whose frequency is each 2 to the 1 12th power higher than the one before it. That factor determines the fret spacing. Each fret divides the strings remaining length by 2 to the 1 12th power, making the frequencies increase by half steps. Fretless instruments, like the violin, make it easier to produce the infinite frequencies between each note, but it makes it harder to play it in tune. So what kind of mathematics do we need in order to understand all this crazy stuff? We need calculus, which is the study of change, but we also need something called differential equations, which uses calculus to predict the future. We also need a subfield of different equations called partial differential equations. That's used when there's more than one variable going on. The first step is always create a model. Create variables to talk about your assumptions. To figure out what's going on, and to mathematize the situation. The second step then is to connect the variables. We have to figure out how these variables are related. Sometimes we have to use equations and physics in order to connect the variables. And finally, the third thing we have to do is solve the system. We can use the equations to predict what's going to happen in the future. If we do this well, it closely models what we see in reality. If we don't do this well, then our prediction doesn't match reality. And then we have to go back to step one, change our variables, change our assumptions, tweak the model a little bit, and go through the whole process again. We're not gonna go through that whole process, but the point is, when we solve a partial differential equation, we predict the future. The power of differential equations is this. If you can model the forces that act on a system, the mathematics will predict what will happen in the future. And that's an amazing thing that mathematics does.